I am glad to be back in the book of 1 Corinthians. I am delighted to have my better half back. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are too. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read a little bit this morning as we go along. But we're going to try to cover this morning verses 1 through 8, and we'll pick up the rest of them tonight. 1 Corinthians is a book written by the Apostle Paul. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth because it, it had, had a lot of issues in it. Amazingly, that uh, the, the issues are, are compounded because of attitudes that they had developed along the way. Paul's already addressed two very distinct problems that were in the church. One was is that they were very clannish, and that is, is they made uh, decisions uh, to align themselves with certain preachers in order for them to be able to divide the church. They probably didn't realize that that's that what they were doing, but they were choosing Paul, some Apollos, some others, and they were choosing these pastors and following them, and the next thing you know, there's like four divisions going on. And the sad thing about clannish is, is we're, we're designed by God through Jesus Christ to bring us all together to be one in Him. But what the devil tries to do is to divide us and separate us. And the way he was working in the church at Corinth, he was getting the people to follow preachers rather than follow Jesus. So that was a particular problem that, uh, that was being addressed. And, and people were saying stuff like, well, I'm going to follow brother so-and-so, I'm going to follow brother so-and-so. Let me tell you something. If you're following Brother Dan, if you're following Brother Tommy, or if you're following Brother Buddy, you're in trouble. The only reason you need to follow me is if I'm following Jesus Christ. Amen. And if I'm following Jesus Christ, you ought to be following me. I work hard on that, but I'm human too. So they were clannish. They were also clever. It was a part of their society. Corinth was a place that was known it resonated their cleverness in way and try to work things out. And rather than seeking the, the unity that they desired, uh, th these, these uh, clever people tried to invent their own way of doing things like going to heaven. They were trying to invent their way. I mean, it was the rise, the, the beginning or the birthplace of what I would call denominationalism. It, it, it sprang up right here in Corinth because they were trying to come up with their path to get to heaven. And man, that has been one of his greatest downfalls from the very beginning. They try, man tries to create his way to get to heaven. And how many ways are there to heaven? One. One. And that's whose way? Jesus. That's Jesus' way. Say it with me. That's Jesus. Jesus' way. That's the only way to heaven. And we may try it, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to be futile. And it's going to be sad. And it's going to be horrific. Because outside of Jesus Christ, there's absolutely no hope for me or you or anyone else. Amen? Amen. So, we have a clever people. We have a clannish people. But then when he comes to chapter 3, he addresses another distinct problem. Carnality. They were carnal people. Not carnal. Carnal. You know what carnal means? You've got a good illustration of it this morning. Jacob looked ahead, knew where I was going, so that's the reason he brought the picture of the world in there. Or at least that's that's what we're going to say, right? But the world, it's the world. We let the things of the world attract us. And, and really what happens, I wish we still had them up here. What happens is, what happens is, is God's blessing us, but we let the world empty us of all the blessings of God. It takes away, it robs us, it creates thirst in us that we kind of like that. That's the carnal side of us. That's the fleshly side of us. That's the Adam side of us. It's a part of our nature. We are carnal spirits. We can't get away from that. So Paul begins to address carnality. People who were walking after the flesh rather than walking after the Spirit of God. We have carnal spirits. Our minds want to go to things that are dark. Amen? Our minds are drawn to the darkness. When you sit down to the TV, we, we were, was it last night? Yeah, it was last night before we even went to the hospital. You can't remember. I know you can't see. 
But but we we were laying together watching TV and there was a hamburger movie come on, a hamburger commercial come on. I think I, she said it was because she immediately said, "Don't look." And there was like I don't know how many girls. There were girls in skimpy bathing suits advertising hamburger. Are you kidding me? What do you think a man a man's going to do when he sees? I mean, goodness, our minds immediately move to darkness. My wife is so spiritually mature, she pushed me away. I have to remember that. Why don't they have guys in skimpy suits every time? Anyway, our hearts, our, our minds are drawn to darkness. Our hearts are drawn to places of evil. Think about it. Our, our hearts are drawn to evil places. Our, our hearts lead us into places that we have absolutely no business to go. And Paul understood that. He knew the human body. Uh, he, he knew. He, he was an educated man. As smart as there was at that day. He knew how the spirit worked in carnality. So he talks about, first of all, the facts of our carnal being. Look at verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to even receive it. Even now you're still not able to see it. So he talks about what I call the facts of carnality. This church family, listen to me, this church family was still childish in the things that they believed. He called them babies in Jesus Christ. Their development, their spiritual development had gone no further. And this was years. It had gone no further than to carry them to still being babies. So the fact of their carnality was is that they were still babies. Paul addressed this very same thing in a letter that he wrote to the church at Rome. And believe this, while he was in Corinth, he was writing the letter to Rome. And he wrote to them in chapter 7 about the types of people that are in the church. And he mentioned three of them. He, he mentioned first of all the spiritual man in verses 1 through 6 of Romans 7. And he talked about how the spiritual man knows what it means to be married to Jesus Christ. That he's dying to himself, he's dying to everything else, and he's producing fruit unto God. The spiritual man's indwelt and filled with the Spirit of God. Which is what we should be as believers. Amen? Amen. That's what we should be. We should be spiritual people filled with the Spirit of God. We know what it means to be married to Jesus Christ. That woman right there is the only woman I have ever known in a physical way in my entire life. I call it one of the greatest blessings I passed on to my son. Amen. We've been together 43 years. We're <coughs> hitched. We're connected. We're tied together. That's what God desires of us in our relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. To be tied together. To be faithful to Him. To be connected to Him and not connected to the world. To not let the world pull us away or separate us. Just like it does in marriage. You can come up with all kinds of reasons for why people divide. But I'll guarantee you, it's sin. God is not the author of division. God is the author of oneness. Bringing people together. Let no man what? Put us under. That's exactly what it said. So there's the spiritual man that's filled and full of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verses 7 through 13 of Romans 7, he talks about the natural man. How, how the man that is, that is born just like every one of us was born. He's the unsaved person doing their best to do what is right. You know why natural man does his best to do what is right? It's his way of trying to earn heaven. I'll guarantee you, I know people that are unsaved, that are lost as a goose, that are just as what we would consider holy as people that are in the church. And they throw it in my face all the time. Well, you know so-and-so up there at church? Listen, I, I'm better than they are. Well, that may be true in the way they live. But you're still a natural man. 
And you can do all the good things that you want to do all your life and none of it is going to be of any benefit in order to get to God's heaven. Because it's not about what I do or you do and all that we do. It's all about what one man did when he died on the cross. So the, the, the natural man is trying his best to earn his way there. It's like the person that tries to keep the law. Paul brought that in in verses 7 through 13. The person that's trying his best to keep the law of Moses. And what they end up, Paul says, is, is that they have an a, uh, instrument of condemnation that comes down upon them. Because the law couldn't save. You couldn't keep the law. You could try it, but there's too many hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dictates of the law. So it was impossible. This man writing this letter, the man that was writing the letter to Rome, he failed miserably when his name was Saul. He was a natural man. He was as lost as lost could be. He failed miserably in trying to keep the law. But on the road to Damascus, a great light blinded him down. That was the Spirit of God. It changed him, made him a new man, Gave him a new name, Paul, and guess what happens? He lived with the conviction of sin, failure, and the judgment to come. But he lived as a man that was saved by the grace of God. He was no longer condemned. He was saved. And then in verses 14 through 23 of Romans 7, he talks about the third guy, the carnal man. And this one hits home. Because this man's saved. This woman's saved. This teenager's saved. Okay? But they're trying to live under the same system as the natural man. Their lips will not tell you, well, I'm trying to do the best I can. But their actions show that. That they're trying to do the best they can. But they do it all with the inner energy of the flesh. And guess what? You're going to fail. And I'm going to tell you something else, that if a person is a carnal person, if they are a believer in Jesus Christ and they're living in the world, the best test for them to know if they're really saved or not is to trust the Holy Spirit inside of them because the Holy Spirit, if you're a child of God and you're living in the world, is not going to allow you to enjoy the pleasures of the flesh, much less the joy of your salvation. Not going to happen. So if the Holy Spirit's not stirring your heart, if the Holy Spirit's not convicting you about the wrong that you're doing or the attachment that you've made as a child of God to the world, guess what? You're lost. You're lost. That's the carnal man. And I said all that to just tell you that Paul wanted to teach them so much about that. But he couldn't. You know why? Because the facts are, they were spiritual babies. They weren't mature enough. They could only talk or hear or be taught the elementary things because they were carnal beings. So spiritually, they were small children. Can you imagine a 20-year-old that is a spiritual baby? Can you imagine a 30-year-old, a 45-year-old, a 60-year-old, a 90-year-old that's still sucking a pacifier, spiritually speaking? That's still dirty in their diaper? Can you imagine... There's a lot of them. This church was full of people just like that. How can you tell a spiritual baby? Well, just look at the childish level that they live on. They're self-centered, for one thing. They want everything to evolve around them in their life. They want to be the center of attention. They're always dependent upon every, on others for everything. Teach me, change me, feed me. Hurt me. That's their mentality. They have a short attention span to spiritual thing. What they do do is go for the glitter in life because they have no sense of value. They're unlearned on their own. They're ruled by their appetites. And they move from one thing to the other and they cannot see anything beyond their little world. Everything is all about their little world. You ever seen a two or three year old? Yeah. Mom looks at one. But I'm telling you, you put them in a room of people, and guess what? They want the attention. That's what two and three-year-olds do. That's what spiritual babies do. They're childish. 
And that's their makeup. They cannot feed themselves. They can't protect themselves. They can't even defend themselves. All they can do is eat, is eat consume, drink, milk. Because they would choke on the Word of God. And listen, these people didn't accept the doctrinal teachings of Paul. And we're going to find out here before long. It may take us a few weeks. But when we get into chapters 13, 14, and 15... That they didn't want to have anything to do with the truth of God's Word. What they wanted was these supernatural gifts so they could say, Hey, I speak in tongues. Or I have the gift of interpretation. Or I have the gift of prophecy. That's all they wanted. They wanted so they could stand up and say, Me, 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 me. When the Spirit of God is working in your life, it's not going to be about you, you, and you. It's going to be about Him, Him, and Him. Amen? Amen? Him, Him, and Him. That's how you know that you're maturing. Look at verse 3. You're still carnal, for where there's envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Now, let me tell you something. <coughs> Spiritual babies walk in envy, strife, and division. <coughs> listen to me, church. You listening? Listen to me. Spiritual babies are more at home when there's division than when there's unity. Spiritual babies love for things to be stirred up. They love for that to happen. That's where they find their best. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Spiritual babies may be at home with division and strife and envy, but this preacher is not at home with those kind of things. I'm going to fight against it. I am going to fight for unity. Amen? Amen? We must fight for unity. That's where God is. Look at verse 4. It says, for, for when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? carnal? Can you imagine? When you choose to follow a man outside of Jesus Christ, let me tell you something. That you couldn't even argue against their carnality because the division showed because they were following men rather than following God. Amen. Denominationalism is accepted today as the norm. But I'm going to tell you something. For the Apostle Paul, he had a horror of it. Let me tell you, even more than that, Jesus prayed that it would not be so. Jesus Christ prayed that there would be the spirit of oneness, spirit of oneness in his church. But I'm going to tell you this. Satan's master plan and strategy has worked 100%. Because what Satan has done in the church is divide and conquer. He divided us as a local body. He divided us with denominations. He's dividing the church all over the earth. Those are the facts. Amen. Satan has brought division. But they're not just the facts. They're the folly of their carnality. Starting in verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers to whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Paulus watered, but God gave the increase. So neither he that plants is anything nor he who waters. But God who gives the increase. Oh, that hurt. Do you get it personally? He that plants and he that waters. We're nothing. But God gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I love that. So there's not only the facts, but listen, there's the folly. The folly. Think, think, think about this. In reality, Paul says, who in the world are you following? We're mere men. We're not Jesus. Bless you. We're not Jesus. Who, who was given up for you? Who has been given to you to help you grow? That's, that's the men that we're given. You know what a pastor is? Ephesians tells it. Pastors are just gifted people that are given to the church to help it grow and to mature. That, that, that's why God gifted you with me. I hope you understand it. I want to be a gift. Okay? I, I really desire to be that. But that's what a pastor is. He's a gifted person given to the church to help the church grow. And that's all they are. It doesn't matter who it is. Just men is given to help. That's the reality. 
We're just men, Paul said. And look at the results of it. He said, I, I planted, Apollos watered. In other words, we're partners in this prep work that's going on. But listen, God gives the increase. It's not like we're a different team. We're the same team. We're Team Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it doesn't matter if you're the planter or if you're the water or if you're the one that comes along like Ronnie and I on our bare feet and kicks the dirt back over the seat. It doesn't matter. That's all we are, just workers in the garden. <coughs> what matters is that God is at work. All of us, if we're ever going to be successful, have to work together to build His kingdom. We're not different. We're one. Not all are gifted to grow and to plant. Not all are patient and concerned to water. It takes each of us. That's the result and the reality of it. And then he mentions in verse 8 the rewards. Let me tell you something. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to plant a garden. You didn't say amen. <laughs> I cannot believe y'all didn't say amen. I highlighted that just so I knew y'all would say amen. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to plant a garden. I mean, you think about it. Anyone can break ground open. Anyone can drop seed. Anyone can come along and cover it up. That's the easy part. But I want to tell you the hard part. <coughs> You want to hear the mysterious part? You want to hear the impossible part? That's when that dry seed germinates. How in the world did it do that? Well, I don't know, but it did it. There's life in that seed. That seed does. But it comes back to life again. And tiny roots start growing down into that wet soil. And green shoots start popping up in a few days. That's the miracle. The part of no explanation can be made except the fact that God created the seed, God let that seed die, God brought life to that seed, and God caused that seed to grow and produce the fruit. Amen. There's no explanation except God did it. That's what happened in my life. <coughs> the seed of sin died, but God raised it up again. When Jesus Christ came in, He was planted in me. Amen. And I began to grow. God never intended for me to be a spiritual baby. God never intended for you to be a spiritual baby. Amen? Amen. God intends for you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Grow and mature. To be able to eat, consume spiritual food. That's good. The miracle's not over. The stem produces a fragrant colored fruit. Bees come along. They pollinate it. And it's transformed from a plant to a plant to a plant. And the next thing you know, fruit comes up. We call it nature. And let me tell you something, folks. We take it for granted. We take it for granted. But listen to me, God did it. God made it. God orchestrated it. God designed it to be the way that it is. And any time man comes in and thinks in his human mind that he can replace what God has established, that man is a fool. You hear me? That man is a fool. It's God. It's God at work. It's God that gives the increase. He made it all. He makes the seed grow and He brings the fruit. It's God. Let me ask you a question. Listen to me. What brings us together as a church family? Let me tell you what it is. He that plants and he that waters are. Who said it? Who said it? You said it? Good girl. He that plants no, I'm going to hit Miss Francis. You'll have to come up here and get it for you while. He that plants, listen to me. He that plants and he that waters. Oh, come up here. Come up here. Come here, I'll help you. He that plants and he that waters are one. Okay? That's all we are. 
It's not him. It's not me. It's God. I, all I did was plan. All he did was patient to go out and water. But guess what? When God does his part, it's one. Get it? It's one. Thanks, sir. Didn't pick on you today, did I? In my life, there was a Mr. Smith. Can you remember her first name? Lorraine Smith, the school teacher. It taught me in Sunday school about the love of God and the fact that Jesus died for me. She planted and she watered, and guess what? God saved my soul. Fruit was born from her labor. When I was in high school, there was a guy named Glenn Smith that taught us. He talked about God. He talked about the church. He talked about serving God. He talked about ministry. He talked about the call of God on one's life. And guess what? He watered and planted and the seed grew. And at 19, I said yes to God's call in my life. That's the way God works. It's not him. It's not her. It's not her. It's not her. It's not you. Guess what? We're one. Quit looking at one another as, oh, they're so and so. Well, listen. I'm no better than Arthur. You wake back there, Arthur? Almost. Almost. <laughs> I'm getting you. Vernon knew he woke up. I saw him. And I'm the one that was up talking about Vernon, and that's not fair. Uh, but listen to me, guys. There's no one here, no one here, better than anybody else. Except Jesus. Except Jesus. I water, somebody else plants, somebody else kicks the dirt over the sea, and God does the rest. And you see, God's called each of us to go and bear a precious seed. Amen? God's called each of us to go and to bear a precious seed. How do you know that your little act of kindness, what kind of seed is sown for God to take and germinate and produce a fruit? Who, who, who would know, Danny, that just a kind gesture at a restaurant might change somebody's thinking about a preacher to something good. I'm going to keep doing that. You know why? Because one of these days, one of Danny's officers is going to need a pastor, I'll guarantee you. I won't be that guy. They're going to need you. But all we're doing is bearing precious seed. We're Johnny Apple Seeds. We're just sowing. And others come along, they water. And we can do all we want, but, but God, God has to do His part. We may not understand it. I mean, my goodness, Ronnie, he was complaining week before last, but this is the rainiest season I've ever seen. He said, it just beats anything i ever seen. Now this week it's dry. Golly, we need rain. You know why? We're never satisfied. Unless we trust God in what He's going to do. We don't have a big crowd as we did last week, but I know God will work. I told you when I came, this, this first year is totally devoted to building a healthy church family. And God's already blessed us. He's already blessed us. He's going to continue to bless us. We have to do our part. We have to do our part. We must be obedient to the process that God has chosen for us to follow. Amen. I'll hush. Let's pray.